and to gather together to worship our God. I want to begin with a couple of announcements, one of which is that this Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, right here at 6.30 p.m., we'll have our, our annual Thanksgiving uh, service of worship. It's really, it's really just a time for people to come and to express the things for which they're thankful over the course of the last year. We'll express our thanks together, we'll pray together a little bit, we'll sing some familiar hymns of thanksgiving to God. And so 6.30 p.m. right here um, in the sanctuary on Wednesday. And then on Thursday morning, the annual Turkey Bowl flag football game will kick off at 9.30 just out there uh, next to the, the school on the athletic field. It's supposed to be cold and even raining this will separate the diehards <laughs> from the die easilies. <laughs> and I don't pretend to be among the diehards. I will be there, but it will probably be bundled up and with a cup of coffee in hand. But Turkey Bowl, 9.30 on uh, Thursday morning. I uh, also want to, uh, want to remind you that the Christmas concert is coming. The Christmas concert. Uh, and it's not, it's beautiful, it's uh, delightful music, but it's, it's music that is pointing you to Christ Jesus. It's music that is proclaiming the gospel in, in lyric and in song. It's coming up on December 3rd and 4th at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. You can pick up invitation cards in the, in the foyer or by the office back here so that you can hand them out to your friends and neighbors. It's beautiful, again, beautiful, well done music, but it's also proclaiming the gospel of Christ. So that being the case, today, the adult and middle school, high school choirs will have rehearsal here this afternoon from 4 to 6 p.m. That's all adults, middle school, high school, 4 to 6 p.m., and then at 6 p.m., Sing Junior will join the rehearsal from 6 to 7. So some of y'all will be rehearsing from 4 to 7. Now, here's the thing. You say, oh, wow, that's very draconian. No, it's not draconian. Here's what it is. We love the Lord, and we want to present excellent and beautiful things to him. And we want to marshal all our skills and talents and gifts and devotion to serve him beautifully. So if you're a part of that, please come today for rehearsal. And I also want to remind you that officer nominations, you'll see this in your bulletin, were due today, but we didn't receive a whole lot. Again, that whole last minute congregation thing. So, officer nomination forms are in the credenza out on the foyer, and please prayerfully consider approaching, approaching a man that you think might be qualified to serve or elder, as elder or deacon and ask, are you, are you willing to serve? Will you prayerfully consider serving? Uh, we're Presbyterians, and so the way that we do things is that you, you nominate those who will lead you. You elect those who will lead you. It is your responsibility and so please prayerfully consider who you might nominate to serve. And before we enter into the service of worship, I'd like to ask uh, Julie Cordray, our head of school for Twin Oaks Christian School, to come give us an update on a number of things, not the least of which is the outcome of the Gala Gala Gala. Thank you, Russ. Good morning, everyone. It's great, as usual, to see all of the friendly faces out there. And as you know, as Russ just mentioned, we just celebrated 50 years of God's faithfulness to Twin Oaks Christian School at our gala recently. We had well over 200 guests, but it felt more like a family reunion to me. I got to see staff who I started teaching with in 2005 who I hadn't seen for years. It was really, really um, a sweet time. And if you were there, you know that our planning committee knocked it out of the park. The venue was beautiful, the food was delicious, the program looked back at where God has had Twin Oaks Christian School and where we're moving forward. Um, but most importantly, the Lord was given the glory for all of the ways he's been faithful to Twin Oaks Christian School. I encourage you, there's a video on the school website um, to go and take a look. It does a great job just kind of summarizing the history of the school and, and where we're headed. So, uh, so far giving has exceeded $85,000, which is wonderful. 
Um, and we expect to continue to receive donations and pledges throughout the rest of the year during our giving season. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And I want to thank you for the support and the prayers that you have given the school. And I'm not just talking about financial gifts. I'm talking about all of the ways that the school feels supported by this body of believers. It is felt and it is so appreciated. Real quickly, I just want to highlight a couple of things that I mentioned at the gala about how we are moving forward into this next season in the life of Twin Oaks Christian School. And even though the way we fulfill that mission today looks quite a bit different than when it was started 50 years ago, its essence is the same. Twin Oaks Christian School glorifies God by, developing, by nurturing spiritual development, academic excellence, and servant leadership in an environment where each child is known and loved. We are committed to moving forward with that mission. So one of the things I'd like to highlight is a new scripture engagement initiative where we're teaching our students Bible study methods that help them dive deep into God's word. So Bible isn't just another subject in their day. It is a way to experience God's word as living and active. We recently had um, a time for students to practice this and a third grade boy had the verse printed on a sheet of paper, had marked, you know, highlighted and underlined and written a note that um, really I thought was a great insightful thought for a nine-year-old boy. Um, but he realized that in part of the verse, he was being invited to think about whether or not he had a heart to work for God. And that of course is gonna lead him to the question do I have a heart for God to begin with? And that's the kind of scripture engagement that our students are participating in. That we're really excited to teach them um, how to go deeper into God's word themselves. One last thing, an academic highlight. Our robotics program is really thriving. They have their first competition on December 10th. So they're very, very excited. And I got to see them, um, they programmed and built a, a robot that actually was able to go and pick something up and move and go through an obstacle course. And I said this at the gala, if you can get a former English teacher jumping up and down and clapping and yelling in robotics class, you know you've got something good. So um, be in prayer for that competition. The students are very excited. So this is just a small sampling of the ways that God is continuing to bless the school and we are continuing to step into our mission. It's a promising glimpse into the future and it is the hope that we have that God will continue to lead us forward in our mission. Psalm 72, 18 and 19 says, praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. Now take a moment to prepare to enter into the presence of our great and glorious Christ to sing his praises.
There's a phrase in Psalm 95 that describes the individuals who had hardened their heart against the Lord. This phrase says, though they had seen my work, though they had seen my work, have you not seen the work of the Lord in the salvation he has wrought in your soul and in the lives of others through Christ? Have you not seen the work of your Lord in the beauty of creation? Have you not seen his shepherding care of you? Indeed, you have seen all of those things. So this morning, soften your hearts and loosen your tongues as God calls us to worship him. Please stand as he does so from Psalm 95 and Psalm 79. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with the songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O come, let us worship God now. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever, from generation to generation. We will recount your grace. I suspect the psalmist was southern. He would say, y'all come now. Let's praise this Lord of ours as we sing hymn number 302, Come Christians, Join to Sing. specifically in the person and work of Christ. Father, you indeed are a good shepherd to us, and so we praise you for your shepherdly care of us and ask that all that we think, say, and do this morning in this service of worship would glorify our chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. In 1 John chapter 3, John talks about something that you all sense, and it's an experience that we all have as believers. You already belong to Christ Jesus, but there's a not yet. You already belong to him, but you are not yet with him fully. That can create a tension that's, that's sometimes difficult to live with. John says it this way, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, 
But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And so there's a tension. You already belong to Christ by faith, but, but you are not yet fully with Christ. You are not yet visibly associated with Christ in the, in the eyes of the world. You are not yet walking with him face to face in a resurrected body on a new heavens and a new earth. There's an I already belong to Christ, but there's a not yet component as well. And that not yet can be hard. It can be hard as uh, trials come. It can be hard as uh, you endure suffering, pain, the loss of friends. It can be hard not yet being in the full experience of the grace and the life for which Christ purchased you. But the not yet won't last long. And so I would encourage you as we turn to our God in a time of prayer and as you consider, again, confessing your sins, also to reaffirm in your own heart this great truth that when he appears, we shall be like him. And you too will be made sinless, and you too will have a resurrected body, and you too will walk with your God face to face and know no shame, for you will have no sin. It's not yet, but it's soon. So let's take a moment silently to come before our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you to turn away from our sin and to turn toward Christ in whom our great confidence is found. We ask not only that you would forgive us our sin, but we pray that you would give us eyes to see that the, the not yet will soon pass away. That you have purchased us through Christ, not merely for a spiritual life with you, but also for a physical life with you. We look forward to his return so that we will be made like him and see him as he is face to face. Father, we pray that you would encourage us through this, for the dark days are many. But, Father, we know that Christ has triumphed over them all. And we pray it in his name. Amen. John continues saying, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And so I want you to know that in Christ, God loves you with a redeeming love. He loves you with an eternal love. And, and your hope, remember that biblically is very different than it is in our culture. I hope I win the lottery is how our culture uses the word hope. But hope in the Bible is an assured confidence. The author of the Hebrews calls it the anchor of the soul. And so you have confidence, hope that every not yet will soon become right now and it is sure in christ jesus for you who believe in him and that is cause to rejoice and so will you stand with me as we sing together jesus lover of my soul it's printed on page five in your bulletin <laughs>
Please be seated. We have the privilege of hearing from one of our missionaries this morning, and you know the pattern. The church sends people out to various places, calls and commissions them, sends them out as missionaries, and then even as, even as when Paul and Barnabas in the city of Antioch, when they returned, they gathered the church together, and they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And so we sent out Susan Newkirk, and uh, periodically she comes back. Welcome. And then she tells us what God is doing in South Africa. We're delighted to see you and to hear from you. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Susan Newkirk. I've been a member of this church for 23 years, but for the last 15, I have not, I've been absent, shall we say, in another continent. Um, but I work with MTW in Cape Town, South Africa. I work in a community called Westlake, and in that community, we've ch planted a church, and I oversee women's and children's ministry there. So I just want to share with you a little bit about what God is doing through you and me in that, in that uh, work. When I think about what the Lord has done in the last few years, I, think, I can't help but think of the word growth. So I'm going to break that down for you and share with you what that growth looks like. The G is for growth in numbers. Unlike a lot of churches, our church doubled in size under COVID. We delivered food parcels to people's homes in Westlake when we were under lockdown and met all kinds of people. And because of that, our church actually doubled in size. Now, growth in numbers is not our key way of working, um, but we are marveling at how the Lord is helping people come to faith in Christ, grow in their relationship with the Lord, and then go and do the same and make disciples of others. The R in growth is for reconciliation. Living in Westlake is a lot like living in a little town where everybody knows your history and everybody knows everything about you. Many of the people in our church have hurt each other in their sinfulness before coming to faith in Christ. It is a slow process, but one couple in our church are learning to forgive a woman who has also come to faith in Christ because she used to be a drug dealer who roped their son into dealing drugs as well many years ago. Please um, pray for them as they continue to heal in their relationship. The O in growth is for ownership. The women in our church are stepping up to lead in our monthly team ministry. They're organizing the food, sharing testimonies, and leading icebreaker games. This is a big step, and it's taken two years for them to be comfortable enough to actually take ownership. Please pray for a woman named Faslin as she shares her testimony next Saturday at our next ladies' tea. The W in growth is for growth in the word. Through Bible studies and one-on-one -on -one disciple discipleship, our church members are growing in their love for the Word of God. I wish you could see the look on Bonita's face when she lights up at what scripture has taught her and how she goes and shares it with other people. It's actually an amazing thing. The T in growth is for teachers. To do children's and women's outreach, we need help and we need volunteers. Praise the Lord for people like Haley, Tracy, Pastor Hendrick, Tish, Sarah, and Sandy who all use their gifts to reach children and women for Christ. That's both when I'm there and also while I'm here in America. The H in growth is for healing. Only the Lord can heal the effects of trauma and dysfunction in the lives of the people of Westlake, many of whom have family members who are, uh, suffer from alcohol abuse or drug addiction. Sometimes there is not complete healing in marriages and family relationships this side of heaven. But healing also happens as people learn to trust the Lord in the midst of their brokenness. Growth, G-R-O-W-T-H. Thanks to ministry partners like Twin Oaks, I'm able to serve in Westlake as the Lord continues to grow his kingdom. I can't thank you enough, my home church, for all that you are doing. God bless you. It is always an encouragement to hear what God is doing in other places in the world. And of course, since, since God deserves the glory, will you stand with me as we sing the doxology, praising him for his blessings, even of growth.
ushers are coming forward. Uh, would you like to give you a brief update? I think you will see in the bulletin there's some financial news about the giving and about the general fund for the first four months of the fiscal year. Just to let you know, at this point in time, we are running about 14% behind on giving compared to last year. That's all I'm going to say because I think that's all you need to know. Okay, it says in the bulletin here, praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We are thankful unto you and bless your name. For you, Lord, are good. Your mercy is everlasting and your truth endures all generations. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your caring for us in our daily journeys. Thank you for guiding us in our decisions. Thank you for giving us wisdom when we stumble. And thank you for leading us to support one another. O oh Lord, the love and care you show us blesses our daily lives, and we're better for it. In humble gratitude, we praise you for your love for us. Father, set our minds on things that are above, where Christ is seated at your right hand, and not on things that are on the earth. You are all we need, and we ask you to help us stay focused on you and your word. Today, Russ will deliver your message and we'll learn that all scripture is breathed out by you, God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Open our hearts that we may fully understand what you want us to know and what actions you want us to pursue. As for you, God, your way is perfect. Jesus has said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We pray for that peace that stills our hearts in times of struggle in our lives. Today we lift up the people of Ukraine, that you, Lord, would restrain the evil intentions of men, that you, Lord, would preserve the lives of innocents. Let us not forget the trials they are going through. We lift up those that are scheduled for surgery soon. Watch over and provide peace for Linda Talley, who will have her hip replacement. Rebecca Marcotte, who will have knee surgery. Also that Dana Edmondson will have successful thyroid surgery. We pray for continued peace, strength, and healing for Laura Fry to regain her strength, Jack Laverne healing on his vocal cords, Emma Wells at Wells health issues, Keith Schreiber's ongoing issues, Barb Reese's ALS treatment, and Les Conover's perseverance and continuing therapy, therapy at home. Lord, be with those that have lost loved ones. Surround them with your love. They may not feel alone. We remember the passing of Michael Gerson, son-in-law of son-in-law of Diane Miller and husband of Don Gerson. May your peace comfort them and other families who have lost loved ones at this time. Watch over our friends and loved ones that are being treated for cancer and those who are dealing with the ravages of this awful disease. May they feel your comforting presence. Lord, we know you did not send your son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that we might be saved. We lift these prayers to you in his mighty name. Amen.
my wife and I uh, did not elope, but I want you to know I'm a big fan of eloping. In fact, I often counsel young, engaged couples just to take the money and run. Uh, say, I say to them, hey, you can have a big reception later if you want to, but now that you're engaged, now that you're committed, just get married. Why? Well, because engagement is often a very difficult period of time. You see, you're, you're already committed, but you're not yet married. You're already one in spirit, but you're not yet one in fact. You're already planning a life together, but you're not yet living a life together. It's a time of anticipation. It's a time of, of eagerness, but it's also a time of challenge. Well, that might be a good way to describe the present time for you who are in Christ Jesus. You already belong to Christ by faith, but you are not yet dwelling with him in glory. You already belong to him by faith, but you're not yet dwelling with him in glory. And as we open God's word today, the Apostle Paul teaches us how to live in that tension of the already, not yet. And so I'd invite you to open with me in your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. And this morning I'll be reading the first four verses of Colossians 3. If you take that black Bible in the pew in front of you, you'll find Colossians 3 on page 984. And I want you to recall that the Apostle Paul has been rebuking, he's been systematically tearing down the tenets of man-made religion and the basic principles of the world. The man-made religion that says, do this or do that or refrain from doing this or refrain from doing that and these things will please the Lord and he will save you. He's even broken down this notion that if you engage in do not taste, do not touch, do not handle, then somehow or another it will make you holier. And even as Brett preached last week, while those things may have the appearance of wisdom, they are of absolutely no value in taming the fallen nature. And so as Paul transitions today in the passage that we'll be reading, he begins to tell you how you should, should think, and how you should live, and what you should do as those whose life is already in and with Christ. And so as I read uh, this morning, I want you to listen for how Paul teaches that your life is with Christ. Right now, your life is with Christ. Your life is already with Christ, and your life is not yet with Christ. It is already with Christ, and it is not yet with Christ. And it's with that in mind that I'd encourage you to look with me at God's Word as I read from Colossians 3, the first four verses, remembering as we read that this is God's holy word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And beloved, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And Paul teaches us that, that our life is in, it is with Christ, and, and he begins by saying, your life is already with Christ. It's already with Christ. Verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, if you, if you have come to believe that your salvation is based on Christ and in, and in Him alone, if you are grounded in Christ Jesus, if you're looking for the work of Christ to save you, if these things are true of you, then you have been raised with Christ. And the reason you've been raised with Christ is because in verse 3, you died. You have died in Christ. Now, I want to acknowledge that the Apostle Paul is talking here to living people, and he's not talking to a congregation filled with Lazaruses. 
He's not talking to a group of people who have physically died and been raised already. He's talking to a group of people who have not yet died, but he says to them, you have died and you have been raised with Christ. Well, in what sense have you died? Well, in Colossians 2 and verse 12, Paul says that you were buried with Christ in baptism. And I want you to consider that you only bury a dead thing. Whether that thing is dead literally or that thing is dead spiritually or that thing is dead symbolically, you bury dead things. And in Colossians 2.20, he says you died to the basic principles of the world. And then asks, why do you want to go ahead and try to live to them again? In other words, Paul says you died to your sin and you died to your own ways of seeking salvation. You have died to your sin in Christ, but you've also died to old, man-made ways of seeking salvation in Christ. You died to both when you believed in Christ. And so verse 1 says, you have been raised with Christ. You have experienced what? A spiritual death and a spiritual resurrection. You haven't yet physically been raised from the dead, but you've been raised spiritually from spiritual death to spiritual life. And therefore, you possess a new spiritual life in Christ. And so in verse 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Well, if your life is hidden with Christ in God, you probably should answer the question, where is Christ? Well, you know where he is because verse 1 tells you he is seated at the right hand of God. Christ is seated at the right hand of God and by faith you are seated there with him. That's, what, that's part of what verse 3 says. And you think, well... How, how, how is that possible? Paul clarifies in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, he says that God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says in a way that is spiritual, in a way that is mysterious, but in a way that is real, even though you are physically here, you are spiritually seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. And this is why Paul is able to say to you out of Philippians chapter 3 that your citizenship is in heaven. That, that's, that's your true nationality. It's your true home. You're seated with Christ. You belong to Christ. Your citizenship is in heaven. All of these things are true of you spiritually. But he says, secondly, in, in verse 3, your life is, is hidden with Christ in God. These things are true, but they're hidden. It's true that you're there with Christ spiritually. It's true that you belong to him. It's true that you're seated at your father's right hand, but it's hidden. In what sense is it hidden? Well, it's not, it's not physically seen. It's not visibly, visibly possible for somebody to look at you and just say, yep, that one. That one's seated at the right hand of the father. Instead, you look like everyone else. Have you noticed that? Pagan and Christian alike, you, you look like everyone else. We don't have a special Christian haircut. That, wouldn't that be fun? Have a special Christian haircut that marks us as Christians. So we all have the same haircut. All around the world, all the Christians, same haircut. You don't have special Christian clothing. You don't have special Christian dietary laws. You don't have any special Christian outward markings that set you apart as believers. By visual appearance, the lost and the saved are often the same. And you have the same sorts of jobs. You live in the same sorts of homes. You wear the same sorts of clothes. You drive the same sorts of cars. And you have the same sorts of blessings that people who don't even know Jesus possess. God be praised if you have the blessing of health. There are people who are complete pagans who hate the Lord and sin all day long unrepentantly and they have the blessings of health and sometimes you do as well. God be praised if you have the blessings of a kind and loving marriage. God be pra praised if you have the, the blessing of, of children who are healthy and growing and happy. God be praised if you have the blessing of running water. It's not a blessing that is unique to Christians, but, but it's a blessing. God be praised if you have the blessing of a stocked pantry and clothing and, and affordable health care. And so if you have all these things, but so do all the pagans, and you share all of the same common trials and heartaches and hurts 
of the unbelievers around you. You are subject to disease, and your body is injured, and sometimes your health declines. You experience heartache. Some of you have gone through the punishing pain of divorce. Some of you are lonely. You have rebellious children, but you also deal with the same things that the world deals with. You have a, a clogged drain, and you have to call the plumber. You have an end pantry and, and it's going to stay empty for two more days because that's when you get paid and you just can't make anything more happen. Before then you have inadequate health care or you need a procedure that is done and it's not being done because you can't afford it. If you live in a violent country, you're subject to violence. If you live in a peaceful country, you're subject to peace. Your lot appears to be thrown in with the rest of mankind and physically it is. All the more so since Christians live dispersed among the nations of the earth. We don't live in a particularly, you know, Christians-only nation or Christians-only city or Christians-only only neighborhoods or even a Christians-only cul-de-sac. But rather, as, as Peter says, in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he addresses his letters to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion. You're elect. Your citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. But you are dispersed among the nations of the earth. And you blend in with them, and visibly there appears to be nothing different about you. And so this is, this is the tension that we live with, because your citizenship is real, but it's invisible. It's hidden with Christ where he is. Your place with Christ in glory is real, but it's invisible. Your death and resurrection are real, but invisible. Your very real life, your very real eternal life with Christ is it's hidden. It can't be observed with human eyes. Your life, though, is already with Christ. Your life is already with Christ. Well, what else is real? What else can you think of that's real, although invisible? The air you breathe is real. If it weren't, you'd all be going, ah, 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 ah. okay, but it's invisible, right? It's real but invisible. Gravity is real but invisible. If I stepped off the end of that stage, I wouldn't float up to the ceiling. Gravity is real, although invisible. Germs are real, although invisible. We've all learned a lot about that lately. So also your life with Christ. It is real. It is as real, more real, than the air you are breathing right now, and yet it is invisible to the naked eye. You don't look any different than the world around you. Well, so what? Why does this matter? Well, Paul tells you in verses 1 and 2, he tells you to do what? Seek the things that are above. And in verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. Seek and set your minds. That word for seek is the same word that is used in Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Seek. Pursue. Seek what? Well, things that are above. What does that mean? Uh, Paul could be talking about all kinds of things. Seek the things that are above. The, the ceiling is above. I don't know that you should be seeking the ceiling. I think, I think Paul has a very particular set of things in mind, and Philippians 4 and verse 8 is kind of a parallel passage where Paul talks to you about the types of things to seek. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about Christ. Seek first Christ and his kingdom and repudiate the things that are below, namely the do not taste, do not touch, do not handle sort of man-made things. Keep from it, shun it, reject it, and seek what is above, and then he says to set your minds on those things that are above. Seek kind of talks to you about what you're supposed to do and the direction you're supposed to do it, and set your minds is the method. So in Philippians 4.10, Paul uses the same word that is here translated, set your mind, but listen to how he uses it in Philippians 4.10. He's talking to the Philippians about how in the past they haven't had the opportunity to give him gifts, financial gifts, to support him in the ministry, but now they have. And so in Philippians 4.10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that at length you have now revived your concern for me. You have set your minds on me. You were indeed concerned for me. Literally, you were indeed 
mindful of me, but you had no opportunity. And so the type of setting your mind on the things above that Paul has in mind is practical thinking. Paul, they had practically set their minds on Paul, and the way that they did that was practically giving him gifts financial to support him in his ministry. So practically doing for Paul, not just as people in our culture will say, well, I'm sending you good thoughts. What, like thoughts have airwaves or something? And you just, you just download your thought onto the voodoo you know, platform and it, and it you know, goes across the world and you send people. Th- That's not what Paul has in mind. He's talking about y- you practically devoting your life to the things that are above. In other words, the life that you have with Christ is in a very real sense in your priorities, in your daily living, more real than the life that you have here. And so Paul talks about this, how do you do it? Well, you already know how to do it. I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't know. You, You read the word and you worship and you pray and you fellowship with believers, and you serve one another, and you consciously choose to prioritize the things that are above rather than the things below. And, and, and even so, you, you may say to yourself, yes, I know that I should be doing these things, and I try to do these things, but I fail, and so do I. And this is where we go to our gracious God in prayer, and we repent and say, will you please help me to do this? Because this is hard to do. Because then I live in a world that for uh, 20 20, well, six days and 23 hours out of every week, I'm just absolutely inundated with a 24-hour news feed that sucks my thinking right down to here to ground level. It's very hard to focus on the things that are above. Well, pray. Ask the Lord for the power to do so. Ask Him for a love for His Word. Ask Him for good friends who will pray for and with you. Accountability often equals accomplishment because you will have friends who will hold your feet to the fire. And I don't know about you, I don't like holding my feet to the fire. Fire hurts. And when you have friends who hold your feet to the fire and say, the flames will not hurt you, he only designs your dross to consume and your gold to refine, then they will help you as you walk as one who is setting his or her mind on the things that are above. So Paul says that your life is already with Christ. Set your mind on that life. Your life is already with Christ, but your life is not yet with Christ. It's already with Christ, but it's not yet with Christ. And that's what Paul teaches in verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Uh, Your life in Christ uh, right now is based upon your spiritual death and resurrection, which you've had in Christ you possess a new status. You are saved. You are spiritually seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You are spiritually set apart. You are spiritually different. You are spiritually beloved. Are you getting, are you getting the adjective there? Spiritually. But Christ came in the flesh, right? Christ came in the flesh not just to save you spiritually, Christ lived in the flesh, Christ died in the flesh, Christ rose in the flesh, Christ ascended in the flesh, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in the flesh, and Christ shall return in the flesh. And so in to prove his fleshliness in his bodily resurrection, Luke in in Luke chapter 24, Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Jesus rose bodily from the dead. And the scripture attests that Jesus will both ascend bodily and he ascended bodily and will return bodily. In Acts chapter 1, as the disciples were looking on, Jesus was lifted up physically lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go. Jesus rose bodily. Jesus ascended bodily. Jesus will return bodily. And Paul teaches that you also will join him and have a resurrected body that is like his. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that 
on that day when Christ returns, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And what that means is that you will live in your flesh forever. One day you will possess a body that is as eternal as your soul is. That is as indestructible as your soul is. You will have not just a spiritual resurrection, but a physical one as well. Even as Jesus said in John 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You see, you already possess salvation by faith. You already are seated with Christ spiritually in glory, but you're not yet physically redeemed. You are not yet physically with Christ in glory. But when Christ returns, you will be. You will be. He is your life. He's its source. And he will surely take you, soul and body, to be with him forever. Even as he said in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you. And what did he say next? Well, if I do go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So there will be, and this is the beautiful thing about it, all these things that are now hidden, that are true of you but are now hidden, when Christ returns, there will be a visible, public, eternal recognition of what is now hidden and invisible. It will be visibly evident to all because you will be radiant and you will be like him. Your life is already in Christ. It's already in Christ, but it's not yet fully in Christ. You remember what it was like as a child on Christmas morning. As a child on Christmas morning, you woke up early. As a child on Christmas morning, you were eager and you were excited. And there was always this dynamic on Christmas morning. Unless you were those crazy people who opened your gifts on Christmas Eve, here was the dynamic on Christmas morning, right? You would get up, and it's already Christmas Day, and it's not yet time to open the presents. Now, as a kid, that created enormous tension and enormous anticipation and eagerness. You see, the presents weren't in doubt. They were right there, already purchased, already wrapped, already under the tree. They weren't in doubt. So there was eagerness and anticipation and expectation. And it's already Christmas. And it's not yet time to open those presents. And so, so... You know that glory is coming, physical, visible, blessed, eternal life with Christ. It's already yours. Christ has already bought it. You just haven't unwrapped it yet. And there's a tension living in the already and the not quite yet. And so one of the things Paul wants you to see is that if you continue to follow the rules of man-made religion, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, it's like a child who's trying to earn the presents that are already purchased, wrapped, and under the tree. Why would you do that? Not only do man-made rules not work, which is what Brett talked about last week, but they're also completely unnecessary because glory is already yours. It's already yours. It's there. Just... Not quite yet. And I want to ask you, are you living accordingly? What does it even look like to live accordingly? Well, uh, again, you reject the man-made religion so that you set your mind on the things that are above, but also anticipate glory practically. So Jesus told this parable of the ten virgins, and five of the virgins were wise, and and they got their lamps ready for the bridegroom to come into town, and, and five of the virgins were foolish, and they didn't. 
And after those who had gotten their lamps ready met with the bridegroom in Matthew 25, verse 13, Jesus, after finishing the story, said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And the way to be ready for a Christ to return, the way to be ready to open the present when he finally says, it's time for you to open this, is by faith in Christ. Continue to exercise faith in Christ and to do so within a community. Worship together and pray together and prioritize his kingdom together. And that's a big part of it. Thinking about how do I set my mind on, on the things of, that are above and how do I, how do I focus on my my citizenship in heaven? How do I do this, this thing that, that we call handling the tension between the already and the not yet? Well, I want you to think of it this way. You don't have to tell a child on Christmas morning to prioritize the presents. It's not like you have to convince them, no, 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 don't choose instead to go to school and do algebra problems. Stay home and open presents. It's not like you're arguing with them. But sometimes, how often do you feel like, and I feel like I do this with me, that you argue with yourself to prioritize those things that should delight you in the first place? That you get dragged away by the world and start to prioritize things that have nothing to do with your eternal life in Christ. Yeah, me too. I do the exact same thing. But you don't have to, to tell a child to prioritize the presents. He's up at 4.57 a.m., getting mom and dad out of bed, begging to open the present because he's eager for it. Are you eager for Christ to come? Are you regularly praying, come Lord Jesus? Are you choosing to live in light of it and prioritize this community of faith as you walk together? Are you also eager for Christ to come because this stuff is wearing out? Who feels a little bit older than they did a decade ago? <laughs> you kids have no, yeah. Um, it, you just wait. That's what people used to tell me. You just wait. Uh, this stuff doesn't last, right? You, you get wrinkles and you get gray hair or no hair. Uh, your waist gets bigger, um, you start taking more pills, you have pain, you carry around little aches and problems. Don't you want a body that is fit for your soul? Don't you have the sense that this body is wearing out around me, that there's a real me on the inside that hasn't aged today, but the me on the outside is really not the same? Don't you want to run and jump and play? You know what I used to do when I was a kid? I'd go out on, on, on recess and we'd play tag, right? And not only am I running and just like planting a foot and stopping and going the other direction and doing it 57 times over a 30-second period as somebody's chasing me, not at all thinking, I'm going to roll my ankle. Not at all thinking, I'm going to blow out my ACL and I'm going to be in crutches for six months. And then they try to tag you and you do this Neo in the Matrix thing you know, to get out of the way and their hand like this. I try to do that now, I would die. <laughs> I, I remember fishing with my dad when I was 12 or 13 years old along this boulder-strewn stream. And instead of just walking from stone to stone to get down the river a ways, I just started running and just jump, 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 each foot perfectly landing on the next stone with this impeccable sense of balance. And I remember my dad, who was probably maybe even younger than I am now, saying, oh, I used to be able to do that. And he couldn't do it anymore, and I can't do it anymore either. I used to do limbo. Remember those limbo competitions on roller skates? <laughs> you laugh, but here's the thing. Don't you want a day to come when you no longer fear slipping on the ice, but when you go run and slide on it with glee like you did when you were eight? Don't you want a day when you're no longer subject to injury, when no illness interrupts the beauty of what God has created, when no dreaded diagnosis comes to your door, when your body no longer restricts your freedom of movement, when it no longer injures your mental acuity, don't you want a time to come when you'll run and be not weary, when you'll walk and be not faint? I want to promise you, it is already yours in Christ. It's just not yet, but it's coming. It's coming. 
eagerly anticipate sitting bodily with Christ in glory, just as you're right now sitting spiritually with him, and rejoice because Christ has done it all for you. There is no do not taste, no do not touch, no do not handle that will add to what Christ has done for you. The present is wrapped, and it's sitting under the tree. It's waiting for you who to believe. It's already Christmas morning. It's just not quite yet time for the present, but soon, soon for all of us will come that great day when we will unwrap that gift and reign with Christ even bodily. So, elope. <laughs> I know every potential mother of the bride here now is angry at me. I'm going to hear about it after the sermon. But if you're engaged, you're already committed, and you're not yet married, so pull the trigger. <laughs> so also you already sit with Christ in the heavenly places, but you're not yet physically with him. You, however, cannot speed up that marriage, because the timing is all Christ's. But you can set your mind on things above, eagerly anticipating the day when the not yet becomes the right now. Please pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great promises we have in him of, of salvation, not just of soul, but also of body, of reigning with Christ, not just spiritually, but also physically. We thank you that we live in the already and the precious promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And Father, help us to navigate with skill and faith and devotion the not yet, eagerly anticipating that moment when the gift of eternal physical life is one that you grant to us to unwrap. Until then, Father, help us to walk with faith, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand with me as we close by singing together, O Church, Arise. It's printed on page 8 in your bulletin.
go as those who know you already possess glory and go as those who meet the challenges of the not yet with grace, with eagerness, and with faithfulness and go with his blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.